You've heard um, brilliantly from the policy guru, and you've heard the intellectual perspective from the historian, and we now switch to the practitioner. I don't usually reference my own career, but in the context of putting active measures into a contemporary perspective, it is relevant. I retired from the Secret Intelligence Service after 38 years of Crown service and have enjoyed a further 19 as a speaking head, a privilege allowed to former chiefs. Thus, for 57 years, Russia and China have been at the center of my professional concerns. One or two colleagues do share my depths of experience, but convention prevents them from speaking and identifying themselves as former intelligence officers. So I should acknowledge, therefore, their contribution. Uh, their contribution <clears throat> to uh, what I have to say today. There's a coda to be added here. A year or so ago, my and Gwydion's ciphered Proton emails were hacked by the Russian state and then released on the web. The Putinist of fellow journalists who were given this apparently juicy expose chose to portray us as the conspirators who destroyed Theresa May's withdrawal agreement. What notoriety and what an endorsement. We must have been doing something right. <laughs> In truth, when the Cold War ended, we'd not expect it to be where we are today. Remember the talk of a peace dividend. When I had responsibility for MI6's share of the secret vote, as it used to be known, the Treasury were actually strongly advocating that SIS should be financed by a customer relationship between intelligence producers and consumers, and that if departments of HMG did not want to pay for the intelligence that they received, then it shouldn't actually be collected. The funding of the agencies would therefore be dependent on the willingness of its customers to pay for them. Now just think about the absurdity of that view for a moment. It's an extreme example of the extent to which we, that is the UK government as a whole, allowed its guard to drop in the expectation that Russia and China could and would change politically. Rest assured, we did manage to destroy this silly initiative, but it started life as a serious proposition. The reality today is that we remain confronted by two autocratic polities still focused on the eventual destruction of our value system. The sheer brutality of Putin's regime leads me towards the conclusion that Russia's political DNA is so corrupted that only another revolutionary change might rebalance it. And that China's declared aim of global domina domination and see the 20th Party Congress's documentation by 2049 is more conventionally explained by the total dominance of its Communist Party leadership and organization. Active measures are as old as Communist Party rule and a fundamental instrument of its foreign policy. And the Soviet defector Kalugin described the term thus, as the heart and soul of the Soviet intelligence, and for that you might as well read Russian intelligence. Not intelligence collection, but subversion. Active measures to weaken the West, to drive wedges in the Western community alliance of all sorts, particularly NATO, to sow discord among allies, thus to prepare the ground in case the war really occurs. Today, its primary executive agencies are for China, as Gwydion told you, the United Front Department of the Chinese Communist Party, and for Russia, 
the SVR, that is its primary foreign intelligence organization. You will all recall the case of the Chinese lawyer, over familiar with the corridors of parliament and flush with funding recently chased out of London. Russian attempts to gerrymander aspects of the last US presidential election are still being investigated. Active measures work best in a fertile social and political environment where naivety about Russian and Chinese intentions is rife, where doubt about our own value system and its foundations has irrational strength. I'm worried when I witness eminent members of our own elite doing the work of our almost enemies for them. Whether it is advocating for Huawei, refusing to publish any scientific, serious scientific study that questions the Chinese narrative on the origins of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. or promoting a settlement in the war between Russia and Ukraine that ignores the peace conditions laid down by President Zelensky. And it is not as if we haven't seen it happen before. Stalin seduced the Webbs, H.G. Wells, and George Bernard Shaw. So high IQ is no protection against idiotic behavior. The penetration of our universities and of our scientific establishment by China has been especially worrying. Might I dare to hope, however, that the brutal and entirely unprovoked invasion of Ukraine and our significantly changed attitude towards to Xi Jinping's China is lifting the veil from the eyes of useful idiots who have fueled active measures for our adversaries. When I joined SIS in 1966, it never occurred to me that I was not on the side of the angels. The swinging 60s were not exactly halcyon days politically or geopolitically in the UK, but we did not entertain any doubt about being on the right side of the Cold War. I was part of a cadre of young officers recruited to contribute to repairing the damage to our national security done by the traitors Philby and Blake. And as a group, under inspirational leadership, we made a significant contribution over time in turning the tables on the KGB and the equivalent Chinese agencies. Looking back, we were self-confident. Without any hint of complacency, we took for granted the fundamental moral difference between the values we espoused and the totalitarian nature of Soviet Russia and Maoist China. The ideological gulf that characterized the separation of the West from the East did not need either explanation or justification. The massive propaganda apparatus that communist world created was an essential crop prop to its credibility. In comparison, we were confident that our liberal values would and could largely make their own cause. And of course, they did eventually prevail, as Gwydion just explained. It seems to me we have since lost our way. Without the essential threat to our way of life that was a constant feature of the Cold War. We've lost cohesion and motivation, and especially our self-confidence. Minority views amplified by social media have been allowed disproportionate political and social space, so that mainline political and social debate has become seriously distorted by fringe movements. Kenya in 19, 
1968 was my first overseas posting. Ryla Odinga, whose name, Ryla Odinga's father, who's now a, a, a prominent politician, Odinga Odinga, was in detention near the Somali border. Why? Because he had been caught mounting a coup to depose President Jomo Kenyatta with the full backing of the Chinese. Kenyatta was seen as a bastion against communist subversion in East Africa and Kenya. And Kenya itself was a post-colonial showcase, politically stable, with a booming economy. The internal intertribal conflict, which was Mau Mau, had been put aside by the Kikuyu, and the huge historical distortions to which Mau Mau and colonial Kenya were to become subjected were unimagined. But today, what do we see? China using Belt and Road to try to achieve the penetration of East Africa, which they achieved only partially in Tanzania in the 1960s. The lesson is the Chinese have not and do not give up. Kissinger explains in his book on China that its pursuit of key international objectives is long-term, patient, and consistent. And meanwhile, we have become laissez-faire about the China threat, and even in some instances, complicit in allowing China to gain ground at our expense. I've just returned from a visit to Ukraine where I was generously given high-level access across the government. It was a humbling experience. War, for all the violence and tragedy that it unleashes, also triggers great creativity and catalyzes motivations. The Ukrainian national identity is being burnished and refined in the fire of war. The confidence of its youthful and talented leadership leaves no room for self-doubt or indulgent and misdirected wokery. Ukraine is fighting for its survival and for Europe's future security. Unavoidably, it is our war as well. Russia could not have had initially a more favorable environment for an active measures campaign in Ukraine. But what is evident is the solidity of the cultural wall that Ukraine has raised around its separate identity. And both France and Germany need to close their ears to the siren voices, certainly amplified from Moscow, pleading for a cessation of the conflict. Ukraine, the victim of unprovoked aggression, is still psychologically a very long distance from thinking that it needs to compromise on the peace conditions laid down by President Zelensky. When Putin launched his invasion of Ukraine, one of my former colleagues commented that it could no longer leave the world in any doubt about the nature of his regime. In short, it was a wake-up call. And we've also seen a far-reaching recalibration of policy and attitude towards China as it has become more assertive and aggressive internationally. There are too many examples to mention of that, but you have the nine dash line in the South China Sea, the suppression of Hong Kong's freedoms, and so on. As global opinion has shifted against Russia and shifts against China too, it is inevitable as the once mighty Red Army struggles on the battlefield that active measures or gray warfare becomes an essential means of compensating for its devastating losses. 
if you are playing for time as Russia is, attempting to divide your adversaries, looking for discrete allies, then active measures is probably your primary alternative means of conflict. And the fertility of the political and social soil is also what encourages you to throw resources into this disguised but vital dimension of conflict. So assume that active measures professionals are working overtime, for example, in the global south and closer to home. And we already see in China sustained activity very recently to persuade us that China is, after all, still a benign merchant trader and that its aggressive intentions have been much exaggerated. However, let me conclude on a more optimistic note. There are a number of reasons why we should raise our heads, get off our knees, and rediscover that sense of confidence that those of us who served in the front line of the Cold War enjoyed. NATO is being massively strengthened, not only by the addition of Finland and in time Sweden, both of which have formidable armed forces, but by large-scale increases in de defense spending, mainly Poland, Germany, and the UK. Germany's implementation remains an issue, however. And I would like to have added, perhaps we're about to see the back of Erdogan, but I'm not quite so sure about that at the moment. European defense policy also remains, thank goodness, a bunch of acronyms and long-term projects which are highly unlikely to distract focus from NATO. And if the UK has any sense, it will avoid re-engaging with organizations like PESCO and Gwydion is an expert on this and is going to talk to a parliamentary committee about it shortly to bring this matter more into the public domain. And I think there's growing understanding across Europe that Brussels does not and cannot do geopolitics. And I might add I'm intrigued by the parallels being drawn today between the EU and the Habsburg Empire of the 19th century. Furthermore, AUKUS, as we've heard, is a powerful statement that the Anglosphere is alive and well and has concrete strategic expression. And equally important is our growing relationship with Japan, which has also started to spend heavily on defense. I'm also pleased when the Director General of the Security Service warns in public that China is one of the most serious threats to our national security. And I'm also pleased to say that the generation of fanatically Euro, but also declinist, former senior British diplomats are moving on and losing influence, though their voice is still overrepresented in the House of Lords. Putin has left us in no doubt that, his hench that what his henchman administration is really like and the lengths it is prepared to go to achieve its aims. And in Ukraine, we have a military ally of surprising guile, ingenuity, and determination, which is winning Europe's war of security. All that we are asked to do is sustain their military while they fight for us. Recovery of all Ukraine's territory is the objective. It's really very, very straightforward. The complexities will come afterwards. And on a closing note, I might add, when I interviewed Mike Pompeo, little plug here for my podcast, yes, I do have one and it has a lot of followers, and asked him how we should treat China, he simply replied, reciprocity. Treat them exactly like they treat us. And that w could well include a good dose of our own active measures. Thank you very much.